So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Marta, for the introduction, uh, for the kind invitation. I'm really happy uh, to be here. Uh, really nice. Uh, yeah, and today, indeed, I will talk about uh, the approaches we're using uh, to look at uh, dynamics of single particles. And next to atomic force microscopy, which you see here on the left, uh, we also use optical tweezers, which you see here on the right. Uh, well, as you've heard, uh, we look at quite a few different types of uh, particles. Uh, my main research interest is the physics of viruses, so I'll focus on that today. So this is a very simple physicist view of the viral life cycle, uh, at least for some viruses, uh, this is uh, roughly true. Uh, the viruses uh, enter the cell, they uncoat, uh, and afterwards new genomes uh, are being produced, uh, viral proteins, uh, and together the cell assembles into a particle and is then released. Uh, in the first part of my talk, uh, I will uh, focus on uh, uh, uncoating, and especially the mechanics, stability of viral particles in, in relation to uncoating. And then afterward, I will move to viral self-assembly. Good, so to start off with the stability of viral particles. Uh, in order to test the stability, we use uh, AFM. Uh, well, atomic force microscopy is an, uh, an uh, scanning probe technique uh, in which you have a very sharp needle and this is scanning over the surface uh, a little bit like the needle of an old-fashioned record player and you make a topographic image of the surface uh, and here you see uh, for instance how a topographic image of a viral particle is being made uh, well, with AFM you get nanometer resolution so you can take a look at very very small dimensions uh, you can also do force measurements, uh, you can do dynamic measurements, uh, and importantly, you can do all measurements in liquid. Uh, so you can change buffer uh, solutions, change pH, adapt salt concentrations, uh, uh, raise or lower temperature, so that's all possible. Now, how do we use this AFM in order to look at the stability of viral particles? For that, I have a small animation. In the animation, you will see how we're imaging viral particles uh, and afterwards start to indent them in order to measure the mechanical properties. The viruses move around in solution. And once they touch the surface, they'll remain attached. As the viruses are too small to observe by light microscopy, we can only observe them by localizing them with a tiny needle, which is part of the atomic force microscope. After localization, we go to the virus center. Zooming out shows us the essential parts of the atomic force microscope. The red arrow shows how we apply a force to the cantilever. This force deforms the virus and bends the cantilever, which can be measured by the quadrant photodiode. The signal of the photodiode can be converted to the applied force and plotted in a graph. If we watch close up, we see how the virus deforms. This deformation is reversible only when we push a little bit. However, if we push really hard, the virus breaks. From the first part of the indentation curve, we can extract the elasticity of the virus. And the top part tells us what force we need to break it. Okay, so that's the idea of our approach. Uh, we first need to find the virus, uh, and uh, after we found it, we go to the center and we start pushing on it. Uh, and while pushing only a little bit, we have this reversible indentation uh, over here, uh, but if you push harder, it breaks. Uh, so the spring constant and the break force are the two typical parameters which we use in order to characterize the mechanical properties of viruses. So we've been studying quite a lot of different viral particles, uh, but I'll focus now on uh, one type of particle, uh, adenovirus. Here you see reconstructions from the two-fold, three-fold, and five-fold symmetry site, uh, and AFM images. Uh, 
Fact is a very much is taken by, by Joost Snyder, which you heard uh, talking yesterday on the native mass spectrometry. So he's not only very good in native mass spectrometry, but also in AFM. Uh, so so uh, after taking these images, it is possible to dent the particles. So denting on the center, and then take a look of what kind of mechanical properties they have. So it turns out that the particle breaks apart, just like in the animation. This is not always the case uh, for viral particles. All the viral particles, they deform only elastically, always bounce back, or sometimes plastically, that they uh, change a little bit their shape. Uh, herpes simplex virus is so big, if you indent on it, a small hole gets in there. It doesn't fall apart completely. But adenovirus really uh, spatters completely, uh, and uh, you have all the components lying on the surface. Uh, so you see the height before, roughly 90 nanometer, the height which is expected, and afterwards it is very low. Uh, so there are 240 hexons in one adenoviral particle, uh, so we are not uh, able to see all 240. Some of them are isolated, many of them just lie in a bunch. Uh, so if you take a look at the isolated ones, uh, of the isolated blobs, I should say, uh, then you can see that these are hexons. It fits with the, the dimensions of a hexon. In atomic force microscopy, you also show, always should take a look at the height. Uh, so it's also what I show here. The height of the particle is 90 nanometer. The width seems to be almost 200 nanometer, but that's because of the tip sample convolution, uh, because the tip has a finite shape. Uh, everything looks much broader in the AFM image. So therefore, never look at widths in an AFM image, at least uh, not at the values of the widths, uh, because that is uh, deceptive. Uh, it's always much too big. But the height is very accurate. Uh, so therefore here, take a look at the height, and also here for the uh, hexon diameters, uh, the height is uh, exactly fitting with uh, what we expect. Well, while pushing on it, of course, we record the force deformation curves. Uh, uh, we take a look at their mechanical properties, uh, and we thought, uh, how can this really be related to infectivity? Adenovirus, uh, during infection, first attaches to a primary receptor, uh, afterwards to a secondary receptor, uh, integrin. Uh, it's taken up in an endosome, uh, and then uh, later it uh, leaves the endosome and it's being shuttled uh, via dynein microtrouble uh, mediated transport towards the nucleus where it is uncoating, setting free its DNA. Well, it was already known that uh, integrin is promoting DNA uncoating. Uh, so you need that, uh, without that you will not have uh, DNA encoding. Uh, um, and there's an antimicrobial uh, peptide, uh, Defensin, which is blocking adenovirus infection. Reconstruction showed that they are both binding to the five-fold symmetry site, uh, so the penton base of adenovirus. Uh, so we used uh, soluble integrin, uh, we added it to our adenoviral particles, and we started to take a look at the mechanical properties of them to see how it behaves. Uh, we did the same for defensin, uh, we added defensin, and took a look if the mechanical properties are changing of the viral particles. Indeed, it was a large change. After integrin binding, the penton stiffness went 50% down, and after defensin binding, it went 70% up. Uh, this correlates exactly with promoting uncoating or blocking uh, infection. Uh, so apparently the penton base, the five-fold symmetry sites, are the important parts uh, where the DNA uh, being set free. And integrin is really needed in order to uh, uh, unlock the penton base so it can be removed easily. Uh, but if you add defense in, then you're really locking the penton base very uh, stiffly into the particle and it cannot uncoat. Uh, so with that, we've shown that there was a direct correlation between infectivity and mechanics. Uh, it was very nice because initially all the AFM non-orientation experiments uh, was uh, yeah, uh, purely uh, because there was a physicist tool, we could do it, we could push on particles, that was it. Uh, but now we also start to understand infectivity better. Well, after this result, we thought, well, uh, maybe we can also say something about maturation. So after the uh, particle has assembled uh, into an immature capsid, uh, adenoviral protease is activated, uh, and uh, pre-proteins are being cleaved, uh, and you get a wild-type mature capsid. Hmm. Our collaborator also had a mutant where not all pre-proteins were cleaved. Some of them were cleaved, others were not completely cleaved. 
And what they saw, there's a large difference in the infectivity between the wild type and the mutant. So we thought, well, that's nice. We already know uh, that it's probably related to stiffness. Uh, uh, in the previous slide, you show how stiffness is uh, regulating uh, infectivity. Uh, so we took a look at the stiffness of these particles. Mm. We expected a big change. In fact, the spring constant was exactly the same. Uh, so we scratched our head and thought, okay, it's not spring constant, apparently. So what can it be then? So then, instead of pushing very hard on the center of the particle, what we did is that we started imaging it for a very long time. So what you see over here, so not a single image, uh, as we do for nano notation, but many, many images. Um, and we saw over time that the pentons are being removed in the wild type particle. Here's see a small movie with uh, all the images uh, stacked. Um, so the whole capsid stays intact, uh, except for the penton. Uh, they are being removed. Uh, uh, this is due to mechanical fatigue uh, in AFM imaging. Uh, you always touch the surface a little bit to make a topographic image. Uh, and if you touch it often enough at a certain moment, uh, things can uh, get loose. For the imager capsid, uh, we also saw changes, but very different changes. It turned out the penton regions were much more stable, but the whole particle started to disassemble. Uh, So you see here the height of the uh, wild type, uh, the mature capsid uh, stays uh, most of the times exactly the same. Sometimes it drops, but most of the times it stays the same. Uh, whereas for the immature capsid, uh, it always uh, drops. It really starts to fall apart. Uh, so completely different mechanical behavior. And take a look at uh, the mutant particle, the G33, uh, which is quite similar to wild type. Uh, it turns out that the fact that pentons are not being released. In wild type, all the pentons are being released, uh, but in the mutant particle, the pentons are not uh, completely being released, uh, typically less than 50%. So there's a clear difference between penton stability of the mutant and the wild type particle. So well, combining all the data we had, we could then conclude uh, that uh, this uh, full penton destabilization only occurs when the genome is present, uh, but also when there's a uh, complete maturation-linked cleavage uh, of pre-protein, uh, pre-protein 6 in this case. So whereas the wild type particle is unable to lyse the endosome and uh, be released, uh, the G33 stays in there uh, and will be degraded and therefore is not able to infect uh, successfully. So this showed that this Maturation-induced pentan destabilization uh, is uh, really essential in order to prime the capsid for endosomal release uh, and a finally disassembly to set the genome free. Oh, we did quite a few other experiments also with uh, adenovirus, also taking a look at uh, what happens when we freeze the particles and when we thaw it, uh, how it affects the stability. Uh, uh, um, and next to that, we look at many different particles, as I said already in the beginning. So overall, we started getting an increasingly better view on mechanical and atomic structure, mechanical uh, by uh, AVM nanoindentation experiments, uh, atomic by reconstructions. Uh, still many open questions, uh, so we continue this, uh, this line of research, uh, but we also understand more and more. So this is about the stability of viral particles. Uh, uh, so I also want to speak about assembly, because whereas we do know what completely assembled viral particles look like for many viruses. Uh, we also know what they consist of, uh, typical protein uh, mon capsid monomers or dimers. Uh, we still do not really understand how this assembling. So I want to tackle this question as well, uh, but uh, traditional atomic force microscopy is quite a slow technique. It takes a couple of minutes to take a single image. Uh, so for the self-assembly, I couldn't use that. Uh, but I did have access to an optical tweezer setup. Uh, so therefore, I use the optical tweezer setup. Now, briefly, what is an optical tweezer setup? Uh, it is a technique in which you can catch micrometer-sized particles in the focus of a laser beam. So, it developed in the 1980s uh, by uh, Arthur Ashkin, and Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for this a few years ago. Uh, Oh, what you need for that is an, a particle, a uh, transparent particle. Uh, you need a uh, very focused laser beam. Uh, 
and due to the change in momentum of refracted rays uh, going through the particle uh, and conservation of momentum, uh, the particle is drawn to the focus. Uh, so therefore, it's called optical tweezers uh, because you don't need you don't need mechanical tweezers. You do not need to go really physically into your sample to catch something. Uh, you can just catch it by light, uh, and it's very powerful. So it catches in three dimensions, and by changing your laser beam, uh, the focus of your laser beam, you can move your beat around, uh, and that's how you can manipulate your in your sample. To know more detail, uh, uh, you can, for instance, take a look at this uh, review. Well, instead of only catching one beat, you can also catch two beats, uh, as you see over here. Uh, so you have two laser beams uh, with which you're catching your uh, beats. Uh, in between, you can attach a genome, uh, for instance, a DNA molecule. Uh, you can uh, functionalize your beats with streptavidin. Uh, you can add biotin tags at the end of your DNA molecule, and that's how you can then catch your DNA in between two beads. Uh, if then afterwards you start to add proteins, uh, capsid proteins in this case, uh, the capsid proteins uh, could start to self-assemble. To self-assemble around the genome, they package the genome, uh, which means the end-to-end -end distance gets shorter. The ends are being pulled together, like this. And you see the beads moving, and that's then uh, how you can deduce that packaging really occurs. Uh, uh, you may labeling it fluorescently, you can see a little bit what's going on. I'll show some examples of it. Uh, uh, but yeah, the main data comes from the distance between the beads. If they're pulled together, then you know packaging is occurring. Well, here you see a uh, bright field microscopy image of two beads, which are uh, caught in an optical trap. Uh, there's a DNA molecule in between, uh, but of course that's yeah, only two nanometers in diameter, so you can't see it with uh, uh, optical microscopy. And if you now start to pull on the beads, so there's no capsid proteins or other proteins present there, it's only the, the beads and the DNA. Start to pull on the one bead. At a certain moment you see this boot moving a little bit, uh, but we only move this laser, so apparently there's an invisible thread in between. This invisible thread is the DNA. Uh, if you pull very, very hard, uh, you first get a so-called overstretching plateau, and then it increases further. If you go back here, you've got a completely different signature. And then if you pull again, the second line is being followed, not the first line. But what's happening in this overstretching plateau is that uh, the, the base pairs are being broken up, uh, so the double-stranded DNA turns into single-stranded DNA. Uh, so if you want to do experiments with double-stranded DNA, what you typically do, you try to catch it. Well, because you can't see the DNA, you don't know if you catch it. So you move one beat. Uh, if you see that the other beat is moving a little bit, and it starts to uh, it starts to level off around 60 piconewton, then you know you have a single DNA molecule. If you have a high concentration of DNA molecules, you also often get to 120 piconewton, for instance. So then you have two DNA molecules. Uh, hmm. If you then go back over here, then uh, you keep your double-stranded DNA. You can do experiments with double-stranded DNA. Yeah. However, if you want to do experiments with single-stranded DNA, then it's much easier to start off with double-stranded DNA and pull very hard, so it turns into single-stranded DNA, than starting right from the start from single-stranded DNA. So therefore, all experiments are typically started with double-stranded DNA, depending if you need both strands or only one strand, you pull a little bit or you pull hard. Uh, So the first uh, virus-like particle we looked at is in fact a synthetic uh, virus-like particle, a rod-shaped artificial uh, VLP. It was uh, developed by the group of Renko de Vries uh, from Wageningen. Uh, and the polypeptide he developed uh, consists of three different parts. Uh, a uh, random coil, which is preventing aggregation. Then a stacking domain, in the, uh, which is necessary for the cooperative assembly of the particle. Uh, and then DNA binding domain in order to package DNA uh, as viruses are doing. Well, AVM images, uh, you see uh, initially DNA and some polypeptides, uh, which in a cell mill into rod-like structures. Well, they seem to be quite stiff, uh, straight 
rod-like uh, particles. Uh, DNA has a rough, uh, roughly a length of 900 nanometer, uh, but the rods over here are 300 nanometer, so it's uh, by packaging it's also really compacting the DNA, uh, as happens in real viruses as well. Uh, and it's a clear cooperative self-assembly process. So then we try to follow this in our optical tweezer setup. We added fluorescence so that we could also see where the particles are attaching. So at the polypeptide, we added the fluorescent tag. Uh, and uh, with the third laser beam, we could then take a look uh, at where the particles are attaching. And what you can see over time is that they're attaching, sometimes large oligomers, sometimes small oligomers, and that they diffuse over the surface of the DNA. So if you want to analyze this, a chymograph is a very convenient uh, method. Uh, so in a chymograph, what you do is you take a look at a single line and you plot this, this single line uh, below each other. So therefore, over time, over the course of seven minutes, you can see what is happening at this position. And you see that a certain position, for instance, over here, big blobs are attaching, but they're not moving. Over here, smaller blobs are attaching, but they move a little bit. Uh, and by characterizing the intensity of your fluorescent dye, uh, you know, uh, or you can calibrate how many monomers you have uh, or how big your oligomers are. Uh, here you see a uh, count uh, histogram of all oligomeric states. Uh, and if you then know what kind of oligomer it is, uh, you can also take a look which one are diffusing and which not. Well, it turns out that the diffusive events, uh, by increasing oligomer size, uh, drops very quickly. So small oligomers are moving, are diffusing over the surface. But if they touch a bigger oligomer, they stay attached uh, and they don't move anymore. Uh, and the big ones, they just directly attach to the DNA, not moving. Okay, so now we know the difference in behavior between small oligomers and big oligomers. Uh, but I told you we were interested in packaging. Uh, the, however, the beads are not being pulled together, so we don't see packaging over here. Well, the reason for this is that we use a very high laser trapping force. The force is so high that the... the the polypeptide couldn't package the DNA. Uh, mm. So next what we did is we used a much lower trapping force. Uh, so we have quite weak traps. Uh, and that, in principle, should allow viral self-assembly, if it works. Uh, mm. So we have the same setup, but now we have much lower laser power. Uh, now to see over time is that indeed the beads are being pulled together. So, so this was the first time that we saw real-life self-assembly of a single virus-like particle. Uh, so with a force of roughly 10, 10 piconewton, uh, you can really see self-assembly occurring. Well, during this self-assembly, you can also take a look if this is a completely gradual uh, uh, event, or whether self-assembly occurs in steps. Here you see the distance of the DNA molecule, and over time, the end-to-end -end distance is decreasing, so it means the beads are being pulled together, what you just saw on the previous slide. Uh, if you now zoom in a bit and even more, then you can see that there indeed there are steps which can be distinguished. Uh, it's not so easy to see it by, uh, by eye uh, for some of the steps, uh, but find, using a step-finding algorithm, you can really clearly distinguish whether there's a step or not. Uh, it turns out that we see uh, both uh, decompaction and compaction, so assembly and disassembly. Uh, and the average compaction size is 30 nanometer, roughly. So the end-to-end -end distance of the DNA is decreasing 30 nanometer. The height of the rod-like particles uh, is roughly 9 nanometer. Uh, it means the diameter of the rods is 9 nanometer. If you have a diameter of 9 nanometer, the circumference is roughly 30 nanometer. So combining all the data, we could then conclude that the DNA is wrapping around the silk core, uh, and that's how the particle is packaging its DNA. Uh. So with that, we've uh, seen how we can use optical uh, tweezers in order to study viral self-assembly. Uh. Mm -hmm. I told you we used optical tweezers because atomic force microscopy is such a slow technique. Uh. Well, that was true until a while ago, uh, but now high-speed AFMs have been developed. Uh, so 
I was wondering, can we use high-speed AFM to look at viral assembly? A little bit of background on the high-speed AFM. I told you traditional AFM takes you three minutes to take a single image. But high-speed AFM, which is developed by a group of Toshio Ando, uh, Kanazawa University, uh, is uh, able to image a couple of orders of magnitude faster. So if you want to read some background on high-speed AFM, you can, for instance, take a look at these uh, references. Hmm. In 2010, uh, Toshio Ando uh, published a paper in which he uh, showed that you can take a look at the uh, movement of uh, myosin motors along actin filaments. Uh, so here you see a single myosin motor walking over an actin filament. Uh, well, this really uh, yeah, shocked uh, the AFM world. Uh, you've everybody waiting for three minutes to take an image. And uh, here you have uh, seven frames per second. Uh, so a complete, complete different approach. Uh, how was this possible? Uh, well, uh, Toshio Ando had to develop a really lot of things. Uh, first, you need for high speed, you need also very high resonance frequencies. Uh, so a low cantilever mass, so very small cantilevers. So it was quite challenging to develop. Uh, you need very fast uh, actuators. Uh, you need that here's a small cantilever. And you need that uh, dummy piezo. So if the piezo, that's the crystal, which is allowing the sub-nanometer movement. So the piezo crystal is extending in one direction. At the opposite side, you have the dummy piezo extending the, the, in the other direction to keep the center of the mass at the same position. Uh, I needed very fast amplitude detectors, uh, adaptive feedback. Uh, and if you only have three of these four things, uh, you still don't have high speed AFM. You really need all four of them. So therefore, it took quite a long time to, uh, to develop. Uh, but then, when it's, uh, Ando had everything combined, uh, you could do this high-speed imaging. Here you see the piezos, these, these crystals, which are responsible for the sub-nanometer movement, uh, uh, the drivers of the piezos, uh, the controllers, very important, the laser diode, which is uh, uh, focused on the backside of the cantilever, and the reflection on the quadrant photoreo tells you how much your cantilever is bending. Uh. So when I saw this, I thought, oh, I really need a high-speed event to look at viral assembly. Yeah, I didn't want to take a look at the molecular motors, but viral assembly. Well, it took a while before I uh, finally got a high-speed AFM, uh, but when that was possible, uh, when I uh, received it, uh, I started trying. Uh, well, it uh, took quite a while to get uh, the viral assembly uh, up and running. Other things worked faster. Uh, but also, finally, viral assembly worked out. Um, and the first virus for which this worked uh, was um, HIV virus, uh, at least taking a look at viral assembly initiation. So we don't see a complete virus assembling. It's purely the first step in viral self-assembly. Uh, HIV, uh, the mature HIV capsid or uh, virus uh, virion uh, consists of a membrane inside the capsid, uh, cone-like uh, capsid. Capsid consists of a few pentons, uh, but mainly hexons. Uh, and these hexons are built up of uh, the, the monomers with a large uh, domain on one side and another one on the other side. Uh. So what we did is we took a look at assembly of two-dimensional sheets of the hexamers. Uh, so with AFM imaging, going in three dimensions is, is a challenge. It is possible. Uh, we can image complete viral particles uh, when they are assembled. But for self-assembly, we just focus on the initiation of it. Uh, we took a look if we can take a look at 2D um, sheets of the hexagons. Indeed, we could image them, so we were happy about that. Uh, but then we thought that can also take a look at dynamics. And indeed, if you take a look over time, in the course of a couple of minutes, uh, we see really big patches uh, which are growing on the surface of, an, um, uh, of our sample after we had the capsid proteins. Uh, you can analyze this, uh, if you take a look at the, uh, the images over time. Uh, you can see that initially you have some uh, low height on your surface, uh, roughly three nanometer. <coughs> That is the, the capsid proteins which are attaching flat to the surface. Uh, and then at a certain moment, uh, we think they start to hexamerize because then all of a sudden it becomes much higher. Uh, single blobs, which are most likely single hexamers, are moving around very quickly uh, until they touch and the growing patch uh, and then they stay there. Uh, this is really very exciting for us to see this, but of course we want to take a look at the single hexamer level. So can we also zoom in? Uh, so that's then what we tried next, uh, to zoom in. Uh, 
And indeed, in zooming in, we were able to see uh, self-assembly of single hexamers uh, and a growing lattice. Complete dynamic process in which you sometimes see assembly and sometimes disassembly. Yeah, so we are very, very excited about this, that we can really see self-assembly at the single uh, particle level um, of these, uh, of the uh, capsid proteins. Um, well, we analyzed how this assembly is uh, occurring. <coughs> and so what we saw is that sometimes monomers, sometimes dimers, or sometimes trimers are attaching uh, and also detaching, as I mentioned before, as you just saw over here. Uh, and together, we could then conclude that the fact that there are many different pathways in which a single hexamer can form, and also different pathways in which the patches are uh, growing, <coughs> typically by uh, growth of uh, hexamers, uh, but sometimes even dimers are attaching, uh, which form part uh, eventually of different hexamers later on. Uh, I've already predicted that self-assembly is a very stochastic pathway and that there are assembly and disassembly events, which was never shown at a single particle level uh, how this self-assembly starts. Uh, and here we are now able to really image this live, uh, how uh, self-assembly is initiated. Uh, well, what we're now trying to do next is to increase our imaging speed. You see these are two frames per second. Uh, and we see monomers attaching dimers or trimers, but for the dimers and trimers, we're not sure if these are real dimers or trimers, or whether these are just two or three monomers which are attaching very quickly after each other. So in the process of increasing this, uh, our uh, acquisition speed, uh, and then we're able to answer the question whether the dimers and trimers are really formed uh, already in solution, and then attach, uh, or whether there are only monomers, uh, and they just sometimes attach very quickly after each other. So this is work in progress. Uh, and hopefully when we're uh, able to image much faster, we'll be able to answer uh, this question. Okay, so now we're able to use the high-speed AFM in order to look at viral assembly. Uh, but we can also use optical tweezers. So I thought, can we also combine this uh, optical tweezers and high-speed AFM? Well, that we tried for hepatitis B virus. Uh, HPV self-assembles from a dimer. Uh, <coughs> Here you have the, the assembly domain in, uh, in the monomers uh, and the nucleic acid binding domain, uh, and you get an, an icosahedral particle. Well, if we now take a look at assembly, in this case, we didn't take double-stranded uh, genome, like for the artificial rod-like uh, VLP. Now we take single-stranded genome. Uh, you have to see after attachment of the dimers, the beads are being pulled together. Uh, you can uh, analyze uh, the the way in which it's pulled together, the end-to-end -end distance, uh, and with the step-finding algorithm again, you can see the steps, uh, and you can make an histogram of the step size. In addition, we uh, added fluorescence to take a look what is uh, happening. Uh, in particular, we added an uh, intercalating dye. Well, intercalating dyes, uh, they're only attaching to double-stranded genome. So if we add it to our single-stranded genome, we don't see anything. Uh, it's not attaching, not lighting up. Uh, but here we saw that uh, if we attach it after we attach the HPV dimers, uh, that we do see some bright spots appearing. Uh, so apparently the hepatitis B virus is not able, only able to uh, package the DNA to uh, reduce the end-to-end -end distance, uh, but also uh, hybridization occurs of the genome. If you try to link the, the signal of the intercalating dye with the end-to-end -end distance, uh, we see in this example that exactly at the moment that there's a packaging steps uh, that you start to see the intercalating dye. Uh, so there's a direct correlation between packaging uh, and the hybridization of the single-stranded genome. Uh, so showing that capsid protein uh, really has the cap capabilities to chaperone formation of double-stranded DNA uh, in this case. Uh, in fact, this is not always happening. Uh, often we don't see this correlation. Uh, so apparently sometimes the uh, genome hybridizes and often it doesn't. And this also fits uh, data from uh, CryoM. Uh. Well, taking a closer look at these packaging signals. Uh, well, uh, sorry, that's, uh, uh, taking a closer look at the packaging steps, I should say. Yeah, we don't see packaging signals. Uh, 
uh, we can see that uh, even in the tension, the force of 11 piconewton, the capture protein is able to uh, condense the nucleic acid. Uh, yeah. Assembly footprint is roughly 70, nano, uh, 70 uh, nucleotides. And then you can uh, determine the work per condensation step, which is roughly 100 kT. Well, per nucleotide, this is uh, 1.5 uh, kT. Uh, take a look at the uh, ATP driven uh, packaging mode of bacteriophage uh, 529. Uh, that uh, is quite a bit larger, uh, roughly 5 kT per, uh, per base pair. But for HPV, we have 1.4 uh, kB per nucleotide. Well, we thought, well, probably this is not a single dimer which is able to uh, to get to this uh, condensation step of 100 kT. Uh, so we did four extension curves, we did pooling on the, uh, on the DNA uh, while packaging, uh, and we could determine the energies involved in the protein-protein uh, and protein-genome interactions. Well, from these energies, we could then uh, determine uh, that there would be a uh, delta G uh, for uh, trimer formation of roughly uh, 50 kT, uh, for uh, pentamer uh, and hexamer 80 and 100, uh, and for a different type of pentamer, diamond-shaped pentamer 90. Well, in fact, I really expected to see these kind of uh, pentamers and you know, these kinds of hexamers. Uh, but the resolution of our optical tweezer setup was not high enough. Uh, it was very high. Uh, we could really see a lot. Uh, but we couldn't distinguish uh, whether we really see the <coughs> uh, uh, any of these structures. Well, the trimer, we didn't see. We could say well, we're close to the, the 100 plus minus 10 kT. But 100 plus minus 10 kT can still be any of these three. So we tried to uh, dive deeper into our data, and uh, well, we tried to, we did dive deeper in our data, but we didn't find uh, an uh, answer to this. So therefore we thought, let's take a look at high-speed AFM. Can we see it maybe with high-speed AFM? Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, we uh, now have an, uh, a mica surface, uh, which is negatively charged as a proxy for the, the genome. Uh, so there's no genome in here. Uh, it's only negatively charged surface and the capsid proteins. Uh. And if you add that, that you see over time, uh, higher order structures are being formed. Uh, and we're able to really follow how these structures are being formed. Uh. So you see X-shaped structures uh, and these X-shaped structures, they then turn into uh, and even higher order structures. So it took a while before we realized what those X-shaped structures are, because of the X-shape, we couldn't really imagine how these dimers are being organized in X-shaped uh, uh, structures. Uh, but then looking at the possible uh, configurations, it became clear very quickly. So here you see this, this, this X-shaped structure being formed, uh, and here you see even higher order structures being formed. Well, these X-ray structures are, in fact, the diamond-shaped pentamers. Uh, in fact, uh, if you take a look at the, the dimers, uh, the higher point of the dimers, you can draw an X over here. So that's what we see. Uh, the diamond-shaped pentamers are being formed, uh, and dodecamers are being formed. Um, so we don't see any regular pentamers being formed. Uh, we don't see hexamers, uh, at least not directly, being formed. Uh, so it all goes via first trimers. Uh, which we uh, didn't see with the optical tweezers. Uh, you know. But then afterwards, the diamond-shaped pentamers, uh, and they then self them further into a dodecamer. So then we could uh, uh, make a small schematic of the pathway of self-assembly initiation of hepatitis B virus, uh, where uh, without the genome present, uh, the dimers uh, are uh, probably in uh, equilibrium with trimers and uh, diamond shaped pentamers. Uh, but once you uh, add a scaffold, so here this is the uh, schematic of the negatively charged uh, genome uh, which is being added, uh, then the diamond shaped pentamers are stable and they will not fall apart again into uh, trimers or uh, trimers of dimers. Uh. But next, these diamond shaped pentamers, uh, they can either a few uh, dimer of dimers and monomers are being added. Uh, and the dodecamers being formed, uh, or another diamond-shaped pentamer is added, and two dimers and the same dodecamer is being formed. Uh, in our data, we seem to see both. Uh, both pathways are possible. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we have shown you how we can use uh, optical tweezers uh, and uh, atomic force microscopy in order to take a look at the stability of uh, viral particles uh, and cell assembly dynamics. Uh, so as I said, we've been looking at quite a few different viruses as well. Uh, uh. However, it could be that you are not uh, at all interested in viruses or not only interested in viruses. So very briefly, I'll show you a couple of examples for which else you can use um, AFM and optical tweezers. Uh, uh, for instance, we used this mechanical probing, this AFM nanonotation, not only to take a look at viral capsids, uh, but also to take a look at vesicles, liposomes, extracellular vesicles, or also lipoprotein particles. Um, so that we can image the particles, they are much more floppy than viral capsids, uh, so it is more challenging, uh, but it is possible if you really tune your imaging force to very low imaging force, you can image them and you can indent them. Uh, you know. For optical tweezers, uh, it's also being used for all sorts of different protein DNA uh, interactions, uh, but also for studies of uh, cell dynamics. Uh, for instance, uh, we uh, trapped a cell in a macrophage in two traps, uh, and we uh, activated it, and we took a look at the single cell uh, activation kinetics. Uh, now there's uh, a few examples how you can use uh, traditional AFM and optical uh, tweezers. Uh, High-speed AFM you can also use for dynamics. As I said, the viral assembly experiments uh, didn't work out uh, that uh, quickly. Uh, so we first got our fingers with other systems. Uh, so we tried to quite a few different systems in order to, uh, to test our high-speed AFM. Uh, and for instance, uh, we took a look at uh, the escort uh, system. Uh, where we could see uh, disassembly and assembly of uh, escort uh, escort protein assemblies. Uh, took a look at the bacterial transporters. Uh, so in that case, uh, we had an, uh, a lipid bilayer on the surface uh, with transporters in there. Take a look at how they're moving up and down. Uh, so you see here uh, the, the two protomers of a uh, transporter moving up and down uh, in uh, yeah, less than two nanometer. Uh, uh, took a look at the assembly of synthetic systems. Uh, the, our chemistry department in Groningen, a uh, lot of people uh, design synthetic systems uh, which self-assemble, uh, which uh, they never seen uh, how it grows exactly at a single particle level. And we're able to image that. Uh, and very recently, we also started looking at the uh, assembly of antibiotics uh, on membranes. Uh, so and here's the example of uh, assembly of antibiotics. Uh, so, so Normal AFM, optical tweezers, high-speed AFM, you can use it for quite a few different uh, approaches. Uh, with that, I've come to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people uh, from my lab, uh, uh, present uh, and past uh, group members, uh, and all our collaborators, uh, because typically the biological constructs that we get, uh, we don't make them ourselves, uh, so we get them from our collaborators, and their inputs are very variable uh, for interpreting uh, the results. Uh, of course, we also need funding, uh, and uh, uh, also like to thank you for your attention. Time for questions. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I didn't know much about AFM, and now uh, I know a little bit more. Um, so really appreciate it. Um, but there are always questions then about what are the limitations and what are the, are the exact conditions that are relevant and not relevant in the, for instance, the assembling of the viruses. And, and one of the things that I, I was just wondering, to what extent is the medium that you use relevant for the um, assembling of the, of the viruses, um, pH, um, ionic strengths, for instance. You mentioned that you can charge your surface. Um, to what extent are they relevant for when you really sort of claim that you can show how these viruses form in vivo? Yeah, uh, it is very relevant. Uh, first of all, to get the, the experiment working at all, 
it is already very uh, relevant. Uh, so if you change uh, the pH or the salt uh, con uh, concentration, uh, then quickly you don't see uh, assembly. Or if you have assembled particles and you change the, the buffer conditions, you can see them disassemble. Uh, we've also seen that. Uh, surface interactions is, uh, is a major thing in AFM, so we're always need to optimize the surface interactions. Often initially, the surface we use, we don't see anything. Uh, and we need to optimize surface charge and other surface properties uh, in order to see something. Uh, so tuning those parameters is always the first step in an AFM experiment uh, and in order to, to see something. So that's in, uh, that's in, uh, yeah, a large amount of time is devoted to that in the beginning. Uh, after when it does work, then we uh, yeah, sometimes change slightly the parameters to see how it's influencing assembly here. Yeah. Yeah, and then to what degree uh, does this really happen in cells? Uh, yeah, it, of course, we don't know. Uh, we would love to have the AFM inside an, uh, a living cell where viruses are assembling, but for the moment, it's just not uh, possible. Uh, you know. So we try to mimic the conditions as good as possible. However, <laughs> AFM tips get dirty very quickly. It's just a nice, sharp tip. It's essential to get a higher resolution. Uh, if you have a lot of proteins floating around, then quickly the proteins attach to the AFM tip, and your sharp tip is not so sharp anymore. Your resolution gets down, you see less. Uh, so typically you don't want to have too much, uh, well, as little as possible in your uh, in your buffer solution. So growth medium or so, uh, we're typically not using, because there's so much floating around, will stick to the tip, uh, stick to the surface, uh, and you don't know anymore what you're looking at. Uh, so from that point of view, we typically use buffer solutions, uh, where we only have salts uh, and the protein of interest uh, there. Uh, Okay, then I'll just squeeze in a comment. Um, so in principle, you have a condensation point from which kind of crystal-like condenses out into a 2D area. Huh? Yeah, no, indeed. Uh, so uh, so we need a high enough concentration of the monomers, uh, otherwise we don't have nucleation. Uh, yeah, uh, so we, we see, we've seen if we lower the concentration, we just don't get nucleation. But then, uh, if we have that, uh, then at a certain moment, yeah, nucleation occurs, and from there onwards, it's, uh, it expands. Uh, yeah. And this nucleation can either be uh, promoted by having a negatively charged genome or a negatively charged uh, surface. Uh, Marcel Hoefnagel, um, regulator from the Dutch Medicines Agency. Um, I was wondering whether you already did any experiments using different ratios of, uh, of capsid proteins or to, to see if there are any, you know, preferences of, of forming or differences in rates. Yeah, so in fact, for the moment, uh, we only used uh, for each experiment one type of capsid proteins. We did use different types of capsid proteins, mutants, uh, for different experiments uh, in order to see uh, yeah, assembly incompetent uh, capsid proteins, for instance, taking a look at what kind of, uh, yeah, what is happening on the surface. And we do see that there are interactions, uh, but to see a different kind of interactions. Uh, yeah. Uh, also and, uh, added some uh, assembly inhibitors, uh, which we also see that it is uh, affecting uh, assembly. Uh, but really, uh, having different types of capsid proteins in the same sample, uh, we, we haven't tried yet. Uh, so. Hi, what is a very interesting presentation. Thanks. So I have just two questions. The first one is, uh, so the, the virus with the same kind of symmetry, so you have analyzed different viruses is it like the same symmetrical viruses will have the same sort of assembly pattern yeah yeah that, that, that's a very good uh, question uh, so uh, so initially when we started doing the AVM nano mutation uh, we also thought well the same kind of uh, symmetry same kind of uh, properties uh, well each time when we thought we understand it we looked at the new particle just to confirm our hypothesis and each time it was completely different behavior uh, so even if the symmetry is uh, the same, uh, still the properties can be uh, or are typically very different and really have to dive into our data and, and into the biology of the viral particles to understand why it was different. Uh, so from that point of view, it's really clear from mechanical properties uh, the, yeah, the symmetry uh, uh, does play a role, uh, but uh, many other factors as well. Uh, what we do see for the mechanical properties uh, is that uh, it seems that viruses that use a packaging motor uh, in order to package the, the genome, uh, they have stiffer shells, 
then particles which use uh, which self assemble around the genome. So from that point of view, we can distinguish between do these two uh, types of classes. Uh, but within these classes, uh, if they have same symmetry or different symmetry, we can't well, predict beforehand how it uh, acts. For assembly, uh, we only looked at a few particles up to now. So for that, it's too early for me to say something about uh, assembly, whether uh, their uh, symmetry, uh, how symmetry is involved. Uh, um, I expect a similar uh, kind of uh, result as for the complete viral particles in the mechanics. Uh, it's really each uh, virus is so different. As a physicist, I was not so happy with that because I thought, oh, it's nice. Uh, we, uh, we can uh, make different classes and understand it. Uh, but uh, yeah, biology is just uh, so, uh, so different to each. Uh, in, uh, Fine. The, the second one is that um, you showed the mechanism of attachment of DNA around the beads and then using the optical teaser, they move apart. So how uniform is that attachment between the two beads like or the results are still consistent across a different set of experiments or runs? Yeah, so purely for the DNA and the beads, uh, so without any uh, capsid proteins, uh, that is very solid, uh, so uh, very reproducible, I should say, yeah. So you can uh, attach the, the, um, the biotinylated DNA, so at the end you typically have a few biotins uh, added uh, of the DNA, yeah, and it attaches to the streptavidin or the bead. Um, and that you can then reproducibly with different molecules. And this, this, this curve I showed with the overstretching plateau, uh, yeah, you, uh, if you do it well, uh, then you really get the same results. And if you don't get the same results, then you know something's wrong and you need to restart your experiment. So that is very reproducible. Uh, if you start etching the capsid proteins, uh, yeah, so what we initially hoped is that we see packaging signals, so uh, that we really saw, uh, see the, the, um, the capsid proteins attaching at, at certain uh, locations. Uh, uh, we haven't seen that yet, uh, but we are uh, still uh, working on that. Uh, so okay, we still have a couple of things we need to optimize in order to really say if we can rule this out, yes or no, in our setup. Uh, so. Good, thanks. I would have a question um, to the stiffness experiments that you showed in the very first part of the presentation. So can you um, elaborate a little bit what we have to imagine as the structural basis of the stiffness? So with this integrin and the defensin, is that the interaction with the individual monomers that kind of stabilizes them, or is it like an uh, interference yeah. with the quaternary interactions of the assembly? Yeah. So for, for the integrins, uh, you have the RGD epitopes, uh, and you have a really clear uh, direct interactions uh, with the penton base. Uh, and reconstructions have shown that after you add uh, integrins, uh, there are on the penton base are five binding sites, but due to steric hindrance, uh, only four integrins can bind. Uh, and due to this, uh, yeah, the steric hindrance, probably there are some, uh, there are some forces involved, uh, which, which, um, turn a little bit the, the penton base. And that is thought as a kind of, of unscrewing the penton base after the attachment of these four integrins. So that's very specific binding, uh, and a change in conformation. And in our mechanical studies, we showed that there's, uh, yeah, not only the structural change, also really mechanical change, really loosening the penton. Now we have this unscrewing. Uh. For the defense in, uh, you have many, many more, uh, binding, uh, and I must say, I don't know exactly how that is binding, but I think that is, uh, uh, much less well defined. Uh. Uh, for the interim. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, um, this is Kang from FDA. Um, do you, can you describe uh, what's the antibody, what's the antibody assembling, I think in your most, uh, in the last slides, you, you sort of mentioned that. Yes, uh, uh, the bottom yes. right. The antibiotics. Oh, Anti antibiotics. Yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. I, I thought yesterday I should increase my font size, uh, but uh, I did it in some places, but not everywhere. Sorry about that. Uh, no, this is uh, antibiotics. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So antibiotic polymers uh, being formed. I had a question. Um, going back to studying the different types of, of uh, uh, capsid proteins and their influence on virus assembly, did you look at AAVs? Because <laughs> I'm still traumatized by yesterday. <laughs> so if we look at mechanical properties of AAVs. Uh, we've done that uh, to take a look um, and at uh, yeah, empty and, and filled particles. Uh, we do see some uh, some difference on that. Uh, you know. But that is still work in progress. Uh, so ah. other groups have already published on, on AAV uh, and uh, yeah, to look at the mechanical properties uh, of a different strain we looked at. Uh, 
And do you know if the stoichiometry matters for assembly of AAVs? Yeah, so so there we, we didn't look yet at assembly. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, so that's one thing also we like to do. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah. Yeah, it would be nice also. Um, it's simple, a simple virus, and uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, and for us, uh, it turned <laughs> out that uh, every virus we thought is a simple virus. <laughs> it was very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, whereas uh, I agree that it, uh, at least interpreting the results, might be easier. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, in our experiences, it doesn't mean that experiments are also easier. Then. And, and so, talking about. Um, uh, challenges you might have, I suppose, working with viruses uh, is a challenge in itself, right? Because you need certain uh, level of biological safety in your yeah. lab. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Uh, so, so, as I said, uh, we don't uh, purify the particles uh, ourselves, uh, so our collaborators uh, typically do that. Uh, you know. So if we take a look at really infectious uh, particles, uh, so infectious for humans, yeah, then we need all the, the proper safety measures. Uh, you also look at uh, bacteriophages or plant viruses, uh, and there uh, they are harmless. Uh, we don't uh, need to do that, so that makes it easier. But for, for instance, hepatitis B virus, we also look at the capsid, uh, but because we had, uh, removed the envelope before, it is also harmless. So then if you only look at the capsid, uh, you can uh, do this under normal physics lab conditions. Uh, yeah. And for assembly, it's only assembly initiation. So also there, uh, yeah, to, uh, to get your proteins, uh, yeah, the, uh, that's a different uh, question. But if you have them, you can look at assembly just in, uh, in their, uh, yeah, normal physics lab conditions. No. But we have an, uh, yeah, an uh, BSL2 lab in order to look at uh, some uh, certain infectious uh, particles uh, with the AFM. So we can do that as well. Are there more questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was curious about how big this uh, ultra small cantilever is. Didn't. Yeah, so, so so typically cantilevers are roughly uh, 200 micrometer in length, but the ultra small ones are 6 micrometer in length. Uh, they're also very, very thin. Uh, so you need to focus uh, the laser on the backside of your cantilever uh, in order to catch the reflected light to see whether the cantilever is, is bending, and that's how you that's how you determine whether you have topography changes or not. Uh, so in, in for the ultra small cantilever, you first have to focus really your laser beam to a very small spot, uh, otherwise the spot is much too uh, much too large. Uh, so yeah, so they're really tiny. Uh, they're really tiny, and it's uh, yeah, it's difficult to make them. There were two companies who uh, who made them in the world, uh, and last year one company, Olympus, uh, s uh, stopped producing them all of a sudden. Uh, so then there was only one company left where we uh, could buy them, uh, and a few months later they had production problems. <laughs> so then we were really in in a big trouble. So now we try to buy a lot, and everybody did that, so that made it even worse. <laughs> and everybody tried to buy a lot uh, to have a stack uh, to have. Um, but now again, we have uh, enough uh, for a while. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's difficult to make them, and the market is not very large. Strangely enough, in 2010, when this paper came out of uh, Toshio Ando on the myosin movement, I thought, well, in 10 years, people are not speaking about high-speed AFM anymore, because everybody will have a high-speed AFM that will be normal AFM. But now we're 13 years later, and still it is only a very small amount of labs we have the high-speed AFM, because yeah, operating it, is is quite challenging. Uh, you um, you do everything in liquid, but your your piezo, the crystal, is very close to the liquid, so you can blow up your uh, piezo very quickly. Yeah, so it's not user friendly at all. So uh, so it's still not used a lot, and therefore also there's not many companies uh, wanting to produce the cantilevers. Uh, huh? Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, if there are no more questions, we can uh, break have a small break for coffee, uh, tea, and we'll be back. I think in. Half an hour, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.